Right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's uh, Tim Brogan, and I work at uh, Jaguar Land Rover uh, up in uh, in Coventry. And uh, it's nice to be here to uh, give you a little insight into some of the work that I've been doing over the last three or four or four years uh, on improving the cost management tools that we've been using within our uh, within our business. Um, it's been a, a really uh, interesting. Uh, time to be there and we've seen some real change and hopefully I can uh, give you a little bit of a, a background in some of that. Thank you. So um, a little bit about myself before we um, get into it. I spent most of my uh, time up until a couple of years ago working in the defence industry, both directly in the MOD and also in NBA systems. Um, I moved over to Jaguar Land Rover, say, middle of 2013, primarily to work on parametric cost estimating. But I found literally the day I arrived, this uh, project that we're going to talk about today was actually kicking off. So I've been uh, involved in that ever since, really. Uh, and uh, it's been a really interesting uh, place to be. So we've got a lot of challenges within our, our business. Um, we're becoming a global manufacturer. We spent a lot of time you now developing uh, new, new, new sites uh, around the world. Um, in Slovakia, uh, we're working uh, on a new site there. Brazil, China, with a joint venture. And also we work um, with uh, Magna Steyr, uh, doing some contract manufacturing for us as well. So we're becoming much more diverse company and we needed to um, bring all of our tools and processes up to a, a world-class standard and that's still an ongoing process um, we're, we're changing not only our uh, logistics uh, um, our engineering and our cost tools all at the same time which is a, an interesting uh, scenario what our the question was, when we originally started the um, project off, was how can we get a hands-off solution that all of the data that is in our, our tools is uh, configuration control, people can't take that data and do what they want with it. It has to be um, output through uh, channels that are controlled. And that's been our, our sort of mantra, and also um, that that data is available across the business um, to all those that need it. Um, and there's about 8,000 users uh, will eventually be using this system. Um, as I said, we as a business that are growing. Uh, a few years ago, we only had a couple of cars uh, in our portfolio. We've now got at least 11, and we announced a new car uh, this week over in the LA uh, show, a, a full electric car. So we're not only changing our car mix, we're also changing our technologies as well. Um, produce certainly this year in excess of half a million cars uh, across our, our two model lines, um, Jaguar, Land Rover, Jaguar and, and Land Rover. And we've also doubled in size of all our people. Um, over the last four years, we've gone up now to 40,000 people across the, uh, the world, opening new plants, and we're selling cars in over 150 countries around the world. We've got three major UK assembly plants in Solihull, in Castle Bromwich and in Halewood up in Merseyside. But as I say, we've also now opened a plant in Brazil. Um, we're just building a plant in Slovakia. And so we've got contract manufacturing and joint venture as well. So lots of um, issues that we um, needed to address. So what we want to talk about today is, 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 the, is the cost tool. And uh, it's probably worth talking about why we needed to, to change that. Day-to-day -day decision making becoming much more uh, complex, but less understood. Lots more cars, lots more parts, lots more people, lots and lots of data, but nobody could actually understand or get to a grip on what was actually going on. Lots more stakeholders, volumes of data. We've got data being generated you know, in, in gigabytes you know, all of the time, but we need to manage that. Um, people just simply can't comprehend what that data is about. And every decision that gets delayed 
puts all of our new model programs back as well. So we have to make sure that our new model programs are coming on at the pace that we want. Business challenges. Um, so expanded portfolio, um, volume. Um, our volumes are going up at, at quite a phenomenal rate. Uh, and we've got essentially a fixed set of assets that we can actually build those cars on. So we need to make sure we've got the best uh, volume mix, product mix, going through each of those sites. So we talked about the manufacturing footprint. That's increasing. Um, what really, really underpins our business is cash flow. Um, we have to make sure that we've got a positive cash flow so that we can pay our bills uh, in the right time period to make sure that we've got the materials inbound that we can make the cars on time. Environment. Um, one of our major pressures is um, it's environmental <coughs> conditions, CO2. Um, lots of countries around the world now are becoming much more tight on their CO2 emissions and the penalties that go against that if you don't make it. Um, hence, we, um, part of that strategy, we announced our first full, full, full electric car at the LA um, Motor Show this week. So that's part of a, an ongoing uh, electrical strategy. Um, we're changing our engineering uh, site, the where I work in, in Coventry, doubling the size, uh, another 60 acres, and all of that will be around hybrid and electric um, technologies. Um, we, we, we'll be creating a technology park and then bringing a lot of our tier one suppliers uh, into, into that park as well, so they're on site with us. And um, supplier partnering, uh, et cetera, we're getting a lot closer to our um, tier one, tier two suppliers so that we're working in harmony rather than uh, against each other. There's a long history, obviously, of Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, both brands, back in the 80s, were under the old British Leyland uh, banner. Um, then BMW bought Land Rover back in 2000. Uh, Ford bought Jaguar in 1989. And then Ford ended up with Jaguar and Land Rover in their portfolio. Uh, up until 2008, when uh, we were bought by Tata. Uh, and since then, uh, we, we've become one uh, organization, Jaguar and Land Rover under one company. So we've ended up with a lot of systems that were originally developed by Ford, and we've still got them as our uh, underpinning systems at this time. But we're bringing uh, new technologies, new uh, processes in to take over from those Ford systems and that take us into a, a new future. The main um, question that our team was asked a few years ago was about data. Um, the senior management team wanted uh, to be, essentially be able to believe the data that they were seeing uh, rather than hearing people's opinions about that data. So we were asked to essentially go back to the original data sources. How could we manage those data sources uh, and bring them into um, a position that people could see them and understand them? Um, and that's what we've done over the last three years. Um, I said all three of our major pillar IT systems, <laughs> the purchasing, the finance, and the uh, engineering systems are all changing. And we've needed to make sure that our system can work both the legacy systems and the new systems that are coming along. Just as an example of that, um, in the old um, days, we used to use a three-part um, relationship for our parts, what we call the prefix, which holds the uh, information about which car it's being used on, the base, which is essentially tells you what it is. Is it a screw? Is it a nut? Is it a seat? And the suffix, and the suffix tells you essentially what what version it's at, um, you know, version one, two, three, and that was fine when we used one part from one manufacturer in one place. But we soon found, when we started to build our system, that that was too limiting. Um, you couldn't actually get to the data by just using that three part. So we had a look around uh, within our systems to see what additional um, data we could use to. Uh, bring that data uh, out. And what we found was that we needed to add, essentially, the supplier of that part and 
the date of that part and where that part was going to be used. Once we added all that to the original data, we were then able to actually say, well, it's that part at that pla from that place and we're going to use it at that time. That then allowed us to manage targets. Um, all of our cars, all of our parts of cars have targets, but they also have those targets are, are time-based, so the target for this year, next year, and the year after will be different. Um, we then start to monitor the actual um, cost of those parts, so what we we're actually procuring those parts for against those time periods. And then we've got another department over in um, purchasing. We've got about 100 cost engineers that do all the should costing, so they go and look at all the parts on our cars and other people's cars, benchmark them, and say what those parts should actually be. And we bring all three of those elements together within our new system. When we started looking at the, um, the systems and the data, we found there was quite a few issues that we needed to um, start to addressing. One was that if you looked on system A and then looked at the same item on system B, it wouldn't necessarily be called the same thing, it might not have the same format uh, uh, of the part number, etc. We've standardised that. Second thing was the data should have been removed from the system. So we went in there, looked at old data, and we found data that was only good for old cars like sort of X types, S types, etc., were still actually in the system. So we've cleansed all that out. Missing data. Uh, again, when we started to look at the, the data sets, you could see that there were certain areas that weren't populated with the right data or the right quantity of data. And we've now gone out and found other sources for that data and brought them into the system. Incorrect data. We found if we looked in, again, in system A and system B, there was variations in data. So we had to go back to the very first principles and work out which was right and then correct where those other systems were showing the wrong data. Data in the wrong place. When we build the construct for a car, build the materials, um, it's all sort of broken down from a car at the top end right down to a part. So a part knows where it exists uh, in that car. Sometimes when you looked again from car A to car B, you'd see that subsystems were in different places. So again, we've been working with engineering to make sure that all of those subsystems are now in a standardized place. Inconsistent data, yep. So you could look on a car that we're making now and then look at another car and the data would not be the same. So again, we've made sure that we've gone back to the prime source of the data and made sure that everything across all those systems is saying the same thing for the different cars. Risk and opportunities. Um, as with every project, there are you know, the risks and opportunities that apply to it everywhere from a, the part level right up to the system level. Um, we've never had a, a very good system for demonstrating those, those risks and opportunities very easily to the business. So what we did uh, in our um, presentation layer is now bring those risks and opportunities to the forefront so people can, can go in and see what risks they own, where they apply to the car, and how, uh, how old those risks are, etc. It gives, gives you all of that supporting data. Target management. So again when we think about a car we set targets all the way from the original um, paper that's kicked that car off that says I need to build a car for X pounds. That gets devolved all the way through all the systems right the way down to the part level. Within our system uh, you can see how all of those tar um, targets match up uh, across the car and how well we're doing against them. Cross-company aligned data view not possible. Because everything wasn't joined up into a single system, you couldn't take a company view. With our new system, you can do that. So what have we done about it? First thing we did, uh, and we're still doing, is a massive data cleansing exercise. Um, we've got about five people within our team spending all their time cleansing data at the moment uh, to make sure that all of that data is correct before we bring it into our system. 
all of our new model programs are built using the, the, the new system, uh, and all of the data we brought into the system has been validated before we brought it in. So we had to go, we use a thing called cost models um, to show how our cars are, are being built, and manufactured and designed. Um, and what they do is cover all of the different, essentially, permutations that you can get in a car. So a, a three-door, a five-door, a hard top, a soft top, a diesel, a petrol. We cover all those uh, within our cost models. And within those cost models, we have things called features. So that could be a, a four-door, um, say a hard top, a soft top, um, a high spec, a low spec. We went in and checked all of those uh, features correct. Uh, we found originally that people thought they had features set A, but when we actually checked the data, it was a hybrid. Uh, so we've cleaned all that out. So each part that we have has to be released, uh, so allowed to be used on, on, on any vehicle. So you will find uh, one part can be used on one or L or N cars, but to be used on anything other than the car that was actually designed for, it has to be engineering released to be used there. Um, and that was we found when we started looking again that there were cars that were using parts that hadn't actually had the, the engineering releases hadn't caught up. Part number combinations are correct. So we talked about prefix base and suffix earlier. Um, each of those prefix base and suffix obviously mean something uh, within our, our business and we had to check that those prefix bases and suffix were correct. So where uh, an item wasn't correct, we then had to go back and through all our engineering release systems, change all those part numbers and make sure that they were right. Again, when we looked at the feature level, we found we either had too many parts or not enough parts to actually make that car within our cost models. Um, we went back, looked at what parts should be within those uh, features and aligned the quantity of parts um, to those desired features. This um, system being a, essentially a design system, we needed to make sure that when that car gets built uh, in the physical world, that the, the parts are still valid. Um, our parts move literally on a, on a daily or hourly basis uh, and we need to make sure that in the sort of two or three months gap between finally signing the project off and starting that those parts are still valid so our system doesn't stop uh, at the end of the, the costing phase, it keeps going through the, um, through the whole life of the car. There was a really strong uh, demand. I think um, one of the presenters in one of the um, other sessions earlier was talking about um, the requirement for senior managers to have all that information on mobile devices. Um, we're no different to that. All our senior management team carry um, tablets, um, iPhones, etc., around, and all of our reports are generated and available uh, to be used on, on those uh, new systems. What we never had, I guess, in the old days when we were using things like Excel spreadsheets, was any kind of business intelligence tools. All our um, reports are built using uh, an SAP uh, business intelligence system uh, as, a, as a backbone, uh, which gives us not only the, the levels of insight that we can drill down, and, and there's some uh, demonstrations later about the way that kind of we drill down, but also the speed. Um, we need, you need a very powerful system in order to make sure that thousands of users are actually getting a good speed of, uh, of refresh. And we also made sure that all of these items are tailored. So if you're a cost engineer, if you're a, a purchasing person, you're seeing the data that you need uh, rather than a whole bunch of data that you have to wade through. So um, the actual system um, is, is actually named from an old Ford system called Red Book. Ford, Ford, if you ever worked for Ford, you'll know that all of their um, projects have a thing called a Red Book. It's basically just a, 
a cost book that um, looks at all the investment costs and all the part costs and puts them all into one place. Um, so in order to differentiate ourselves from the existing Red Book, we call ourselves Next Generation Red Book. But it holds essentially the same data. Um, the current systems that we've been using are Excel and SQL based, uh, very difficult to maintain, no real um, configuration control on them. Uh, and that's what we were um, tasked to bring to the party as well as the actual um, depth of insight. What people now look at our system as, as a single source of truth, if it, we're saying it's X pounds uh, and they don't believe it's correct, then we need to go back and sort of check those two from our, our master systems, but, but we drag everything through from those master data systems. Um, Module teams, module teams own parts of the car, so um, they, the car is split up not only in features and parts, but in sort of system levels as well. We spent a lot of time talking to all our customers in all the different areas, developing uh, this system. We didn't just sort of develop it in isolation and then deliver it to people. We brought everybody in uh, as we went through that development process. So finance, purchasing, engineering, and the program teams were all brought in and helped us to actually develop the tools so that they actually fitted the requirements that they actually had. Future plans. Um, at the moment, we're kind of sat in the middle of the project life cycle. We don't begin when the project begins and we don't end when the, when the entire project's finished. But we're actually now expanding into those areas. So the first thing we're going to do is, is move to hold those costs throughout the cost, um, time to develop those cars and then we're going to move towards the front end as well. So when the project's kicked off, all of the uh, initial assumptions and costs will be held in our system right through to the very last car being built. So the solution, um, it's in two parts really, um, a database and um, a reporting layer. Um, one central database that we own, uh, and it's very, very restricted, there's only about 10 people in the company can actually get into that central database. All of the information that comes in is pre-processed through our sort of processing systems to make sure it's all completely validated before it comes into our system, because once it's in the system, it's available to all. So we've got a small team um, that sits in our area and we, uh, we administer that um, central processing system. Um, but anybody uh, that requests it can actually have access, um, assuming they've got a, a valid reason to have it. We only produce one uh, update a day, uh, and that, that's really so that if you start the day off seeing that your car costs X pounds, you know at the end of the day it'll still cost X pounds and then tomorrow it, it, it'll move on. It, it doesn't change during the day. So we, we bring the information in, we pre-process it, we hold it and then overnight we, we, we generate it into that system. It's a bit of a, a, a diagram of what we're actually playing with. So the central dark blue area is, is our database and that's an ERP system that we bought. Uh, from um, an ERP company. Uh, that interfaces to SA, SAP business objects and all those um, systems interface to our current and future systems. Um, WERS is, is an engineering system, the current engineering system, and WIPS is the um, current purchasing system. We're moving from there to, to, to new versions of that. Um, those, those are all sort of legacy um, mainframes that are really old, slow, and, and not very useful. But as you can see, um, we're also then outputting the data into mobile devices as well. So both sides of the equation are on, on our development path um, and have been probably longer than we have, but because our systems are more embedded, uh, they're taking longer to, um, to update. So, kind of what, what happens, I guess, how do we get the data from 
the systems that are out there in the, in the, in the, in the, the business into our system. So every change that we have on a car is managed, um, and it's managed through a process um, that uses essentially an Excel spreadsheet to show what the uh, impact of all those changes are. We take the, all those spreadsheets, we process them, clean them up, make them into one large uh, environment, and then overnight we push that through, and then the people the next day can, can pick that system up and see what the change was uh, overnight. So, obviously our, our developments cost quite a lot of money for the business, uh, and to recoup that business, you know, what have we done to uh, make ourselves useful? Single source of the truth uh, is now a reality. Um, most of the teams used to spend a really long time going through crunching data, trying to make some sense of it. They don't have to do that anymore. We do that on, on their behalf. So it's freed them up to spend a lot more time actually delving into the reasons behind why these things are happening rather than the, um, the impacts of them. So a lot more information is available to a lot more people and it means that we can make decisions a lot quicker as well. Um, obviously our, our business moves very quickly. Um, unlike some of the, the longer term projects in, in say perhaps um, defence or, or construction, uh, our, our, all our um, projects are moving literally on a daily basis and we can essentially turn uh, technologies on and off as well. So um, we may be expected to put a technology into a car that's coming out this year uh, and that may or may not happen. If it doesn't happen we have to cut that out um, literally overnight and then assess all the impacts etc. So each person that has the system has this dashboard uh, on, their, on, their on their laptop or on, on their um, device. It's web-based, so they can access it from anywhere in the world as long as they've got the secure access into our system. It's essentially what we're calling a knowledge portal. So um, when you go on there, all of the training information's on there, all of the access information, etc. It's not just a set of tiles to go in and um, look at what the data is. Very, very strict controls on um, who can see this data. Uh, anybody that has the system sees this set of tiles, but just because you've got the set of tiles doesn't mean you can actually get beyond, beyond, beyond them to see what the data actually is. So you have to have the right job profile, the right requirements, and the right security access to actually go in and see what that data actually tells you. Because obviously uh, everything in there is really, really secure, really, really sensitive. Um, and we have quite a lot of people on our sites that don't actually work directly for Jaguar Land Rover. Um, so we have to make sure that they don't actually see what's going on uh, in that data space. Um, so once you get beyond the, the front end, you, you start to see a whole set of reports. These allow you to go in and say, actually, I want to see this car, that car, this part, that part, make a selection, and then have that uh, shown on your screen. So, top left-hand corner is a favourite. So, if you, you're running the same reports day after day, you don't have to go in there and set them up. You just go into your favourites. Four different ways to filter the data, uh, depending on, on which you're actually in. Uh, and you can select one or more of those to actually put the filters on. A list of reports. Uh, so if you've done that selection, there are actually you know, various things you can actually do with that data once you've run, once you've run it. And there's also a little button on there, a little blue button uh, with an eye button. If you press that, that goes to a help screen and tells you what that report's actually all about. So. We talked about the car being built in, in layers, I guess. Um, and the reports do the same thing. So you can go to the very top layer, uh, and essentially each of those columns is, is, is a, a variation on, on the car. Um, and then, then at that, you can then drill down from that to a single uh, element and start to then look at all the subsystems within that. And then you can go all the way down, eventually, to a single part record. Um, so you can always get back to the actual base data within, within that system, look at it, and then 
decide what you want to do. Training. Um, because it's such a, an all-encompassing system, we didn't essentially just drop it onto people. There's a whole set of training packages. So when you go onto the web page, there is a, an introduction video that you can have a look at. Then there's a whole series of e-learning packages that you can do online. And there's also, um, certainly for super users that we have on the system, there's a classroom-based um, uh, training package as well. E-learning. So when you go onto the screen, you can actually say, you know, I want to learn about this part of the system, that part of the system, and then it'll bring up a training package that talks about that. So, in conclusion, um, we've made a start uh, on this. Um, we've got quite a way down the, um, the road, but there's a long way to go. I say we're, we're certainly looking at uh, expanding scope, bringing more information in, making it more accessible and usable for people. We've got a really high demand for this system. People want to, are seeing it, they're seeing the benefits and they really want to get onto it. Uh, so they're saying, oh, can you put this element in, that element in as well. So we're looking, uh, at, as you said, their customs duty. We pay a lot, a lot of money in customs duty and VAT. They want to see all that wrapped up with our car costs as well. Um, lots and lots of data cleansing. Um, it's our aim to get 100% of our programs in. So we probably run at any one time 20, 30 different projects. Uh, all those will be, will be covered um, very soon by that system. People will now see the same thing the same way in the same time all, all over the business. So if you see um, report style X, it'll always be the same on, on, on all of those cars. It, there's, no, there's no variance in that. Um, one of the mantras that we work to is sort of one part, one price, one time, one location. So um, what you can't have is multiple costs for a part that break those rules. Um, so that, that's what we've brought to the table. Um, and we've also bridged those links between purchasing and engineering, which were never there before. They were completely separate pillar systems. We plonked ourselves in the middle and, and are drawing data from both of those sides of the equation. That's the first time that's, that's happened within the business. And we're still really on a purge to, to get rid of, lots of people have little, little systems around the business. We're trying to get rid of those so everybody has a standard view of the system. Right. I think that's that's me. <laughs> Anybody got any questions or no. so, Andrew Rooker BA systems. Yeah. You you talk about a part that fits a bolt that fits to the car. Yeah. That presumably could come from any different uh, number of vendors? Potentially, yes. Yes, so that, that will vary in, in price naturally, but you'll yes. pro probably market it as an average, yeah. average price. Yeah. But going back to the cast of the raw metal of it, surely you'll have traceability right back to the uh, where it, it's a melting pot. Yeah, yes, so, so yeah, uh, we can trace all those batches. Uh, we know what's on the shop floor at any one time, but yeah, it, we do get multiple prices from multiple ven vendors and what our system does you can have a we know what the split is so say so 70 30 60 40 we can average that within our system against this any number of prices yep yeah so yeah we have all of that traceability in, in the manufacturing side yeah right. <laughs> no more questions well, thank you very much. <laughs>